We're, we're continuing on our, on our series of uh, great therefores in the Bible, and I'm going to be in the book of John right now. We're going to do the book of John and Acts today, and I'll be reading some verses out of John chapter 2. Great therefores in the Bible, when God says, therefore you should do this, or therefore this happened, um, you look before to see what it is there for. And that God's going to tell you a reason. Reasons are important in the Bible. God does things for a reason. He says things for a reason. Many people don't understand uh, the reason you'd serve God, and so they don't know the greatness of it and the joy of it. But it's always about why. And uh, so he's going to tell us what it's there for. And so we're going to be in John chapter 2 and verse 22. It says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, uh, said that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. All right, let's pray and we'll get into this lesson. Lord, thank you for everybody who's come today. Thank you for the chance to be together and learn your word. I thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the guidance it gives. Thank you. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you. We don't have to walk around blindly as we'll even find out in this uh, lesson today. We pray in Jesus' name that your spirit would move and you'd help us to see uh, the word and uh, see what you have for us. We need you today. We pray for your help, Lord, in a mighty way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we see a passage here. Jesus uh, talks about uh, uh, these, uh, uh, <clears throat> about, about therefore, them remembering his word in John chapter 2 and uh, verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead. When therefore he is risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture. So at this point, there's a therefore, and uh, the therefore says, uh, at this point, they remembered that Jesus had told them, um, I will be risen from the dead. And uh, it refers back to uh, verse 19. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and, and in three days I will raise it up. Then to the Jews, forty and six years was his temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But this spake ye the temple of his body. So many things here. First of all, um, the Bible introduces here in the Gospels when Jesus says, my, my body is the temple. He introduces uh, this new concept that our bodies are the temple of God. That was not before. Before that, the temple was a physical building. And at this point, God changed it, and he said, no, now the temple is your is is my body and the temple is going to be our bodies and now of course we're the temple of the holy ghost and uh, and so he prophesied about this temple he said destroy this temple and in three days i'll raise it up the the pharisees then the, and the scribes who were his constant enemies did not understand and so they said look this temple took 40 years to build you're going to build it in three days and they thought he was speaking of the temple and uh, he, uh, it's, it's fascinating, and I'm developing a message on it, that, that uh, when God allows somebody to be blind, and uh, because of their choice and their will, and they just miss it. And we're going to talk about blindness a little bit today. <coughs> but they didn't get it. They didn't understand it at all. And he said, look, I'm, uh, destroy this temple in three days. Well, he told everybody that. And and uh, and then he told his disciples that, and uh, and and everybody else. And then he was raised the dead, and they remembered that. They remember that he said that. Verse twenty two. When therefore he's risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and uh, they believed the scripture, and the word which Jesus had said. So two things there. Jesus was quoting back in the Old Testament. We'll we'll see this in a while in Psalms and other places where it said if that the, the Messiah would die and be raised again three days later. And, uh, and so he had quoted the scripture and told them the scripture says that. And then he told them the same thing. After he's resurrected, they remember that, that he had said that. They remember that, that the scripture had said that. And they believed both the scripture and the word of Jesus. And of course, the word of Jesus was to become scripture as, uh, as we read it, as we read it today. We see this also in the book of Acts. The book of Acts in chapter 2 the same thing, the resurrection prophesied and, uh, and spoken of before Christ was ever on earth. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is in my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore, 
uh, did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, all my, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer, suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And uh, so he's, of course, rejoicing and saying, my soul's glad, because um, the Messiah is going to be raised from the dead. And uh, there's the, the quote out of the Old Testament of the book of Psalms, and he says, uh, you're going to raise me from the dead. And uh, what joy, what joy that must have been, you know. Of course, they're with Jesus all the time. They're with him every day, and, and they left their jobs. They left their boats. They left everything, and they're spending time with Jesus. And then as they do that, they go and, uh, and, and, and live their life based on his teaching and follow him, and then, then he's taken and put on trial and killed, crucified. They see him crucified, and uh, spear in his side after he's been crucified, and he's dead, and, and uh, he's in the grave three days. And uh, then they find the empty tomb, of course. Then they see him, and he appears to him over and over again. And that's the, one of the most amazing things is he didn't just appear to the disciples one time. He appeared to the disciples many times. He appeared to many other people, or 500 people. And, uh, and he showed himself alive over and over. And, and none of the people ever denied it. Nobody ever said, I made this up. Nobody ever said that. If, and there's, there's so many proofs. The Romans didn't want this to be true. Because that means he's the king of the Jews. That means he's the, uh, he, is, uh, he, he is a threat to Caesar. And all they had to do is produce the body. They could have tortured anybody they wanted to and say, give us the body until they did that. But they never could find the body um, because it wasn't there. And, and imagine their joy when they said, when they find out he's risen from the dead. And it's weird because they, they had a sort of uh, a fog over their eyes where they just, they were confused and stunned. And then when Jesus said, hey, I told you this, the angel said, it's prophesied. And they remembered, you know, he did tell us that. He did tell us that. You see, how in the world can they forget that? You know, one of the strange things about that, when, and, and you, can, you can do this and you can understand this, is how can they possibly forget that Jesus told them that during the, the death, burial, and resurrection? How many times has God done amazing work in your life and showed you a truth, and then you start going through a hard time, and you forget all that God's taught you, and you forget all the faith that you learned, and all the growth that God's given you, how God showed He's going to take care of you, and you do all those things, how can you, and then all of a sudden you and I forget, and we were all worried. And then afterward, you say, you know, I should have known that. God took care of me before. God gave me this promise before. God promised it before. I just forgot about it. And, and, uh, and, and it's human nature to, in hard times and darkness, to forget what you saw in the light. And, and, and they had great joy. And when he was risen, they remembered these things, therefore, it says. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful verse in, in, in John chapter 2. He says, therefore, they remembered his words, remember the scripture. And, and the greatest event in history is, of course, the resurrection. And what joy they must have had when they thought everything was lost. And now he's risen. Now we've got to preach the gospel to every creature. Now we've got to reach the world and all these things. What joy that is. Number two, um, uh, therefore, is we're going to go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And verse 47. He, had, uh, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Wow. Pretty powerful verse there. What's the therefore in there? Ye therefore hear them not. Hear not the words of God. Why don't they hear the words of God? Anybody raise your hand? Why don't they hear the words of God, these people? Yes, Keith? Not of God, yeah. He's of God, heareth God's word. Um, I, I, I wish I could... I, 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 I so badly wish I could gather every preacher in America and just, just explain to them how not to be so stressed about everything. What if people get offended? What if you preach on this? And, and, and what if this happens? What if people leave? And what if that? Look, people's responses have, if you do things right, have little to do with you. It has to do with God. He said, if they hate me, they hate you, hate you also. If you kind of get out of the way, now, if you're mean and nasty or whatever, you kind of become the problem. But if you get out of the way and just say what God says, then the, the deal is on them. If they love God, they'll receive it. Look, if somebody's heart is right with God, you can rebuke them as hard as you want. 
And they say, yeah, the Bible says that. That's right. Even if they're not, even if they're convicted, even if they feel bad, you know what? He's it of God receives God's word. Most people who are God, they want to know the truth. I don't think we live in a day where nobody wants to know the truth. Uh, most, uh, the, besides our converts who got saved at open door, the, by far and away by five times, the reason people come to our church is to hear the Bible preached clearly. To hear the truth. Because people need the Bible. And the truth sets you free. And look, it's, it's, it's not about us. It's not about the preacher. It's not about you and, what, and you saying, am I going to, are they going to be offended? Look, <clears throat> you got to give them the truth. Speaking the truth in love. But open rebuke is better than secret love. And what they do with the truth reveals not, did you say it right or should I have said that? It reveals more about them than it reveals about you. Because he's that of God, here's God's word. And no preacher and no teacher should be afraid to say what God says because the crowds won't like them. He's that of God receives God's word. All you're doing is putting a fake mask over things when you, when you, when you do not preach the word of God and don't say what God says. All you're doing is delaying the inevitable, which is them not serving God because they're afraid of the truth. And look, you got to face the truth someday. Jesus is the truth. If you're not going to accept the truth, you're not going to accept Jesus. Because he is the truth. And, 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 and it's liberating when you realize he's enough God received these words. And the response speaks a lot on this. Jesus says in verse 47, he that, heareth God's, uh, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Said we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? The response tells a lot is they do a personal attack. <laughs> that's a personal attack, and that's a, that is the method. Just understand that. Understand, just, you'll see it in society. You'll see it in relationships. You'll see it. When someone is wrong and they don't have an answer, they resort to personal attacks, and they attack the messenger instead of facing the message. And, and, and in this whole chapter, they're just arguing with him and arguing with him. They're missing the point of what he's saying is the amazing thing. And, he, and the amazing, Jesus was not a person. He was speaking to them clear truth. And he says in this chapter, why do you not understand? I just told you I came from God. Why don't you understand that? And they didn't understand so many things. And they, they did that. And their, their response tells a lot. And, uh, and, 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 and so we see that they, they couldn't handle the truth. We're going to get into that, uh, some more verses along the way. But they couldn't handle the truth. You know the scariest thing? The scariest thing to me today is not that people reject the truth. The scariest thing to me is they make up truth on the spot and act like it has authority. That's what's scary. If they just say, you know what, I don't want to serve God. I want to go live for the world. I want to go sin. You know what, I don't, I don't, you know, whatever. But they, 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 they make up a God on the spot. Well, I think God's like this, and I think God really accepts me. I think God just wants me to worship him this way, and I think God is happy with me, and I think God, and you're just making up a God on the spot. Based on what? I think. Do you know how, how wrong our thinking is sometimes? I mean, people think all kinds of things that are crazy. They think this medical thing is going to fix them. They think their team's going to win. They think this marriage is going to work out. They think their health is always going to be good. They think all kinds of things, and they're wrong. They think traffic's clear. They think that uh, they're going to have a great day at work. You think all kinds of things, and you're wrong all the time because you're human. And you, th you just say, I think God accepts this. I think the way to God is this. And you don't have, you don't have some ancient text you got what you're winging right there off the top of your head and what you feel and what it actually is, although nobody knows this, is incredible. What it actually is is what you saw on the TV and internet and you're parroting them. I think God just cares about our heart. I'm a very spiritual person. I'm just not religious. And all these, these cute little phrases, I just follow my heart. God knows I have a good heart. All unbiblical statements, all against the Bible. Every single statement is made is unbiblical. No, that, that, that's true. 
you think it's true because you sat and listened to the world so much. And you heard it so many times, repeated, and repeated so many times because that's what society is. That's the society's God's right now. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. But the Bible says there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Isaiah 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've gone to every man to his own path. And, and, and look, some people just can't handle the truth. I would, I would be much, I would say somebody's much safer if they said, you know what, the Bible does say that, but you know what, I don't want to do it. And then they go up and make up a truth on the spot. And you know what they are? They are making themselves God because they have the ultimate truth by what they feel at that particular time. And the weird thing is it changes. The same person will say, you know, I just, I just feel like God just understands. He doesn't really believe, you know, that he isn't really that strict and he's really a nice God. And then 10 years later, they're an atheist. Okay, if, you're, if, you're, if your doctrine changed and you were an agnostic at this point, an atheist at this point, and an atheist at this point, and, and you just rejected the Bible at another point, and then you just said, well, yeah, God says that, but it's, you know, he's not that strict. Or then you said you believed it before. Do you understand how many times your doctrine has changed? You've been wrong a whole bunch of times. So maybe you should say, maybe not be so sure. I said before, God is not Mr. Potato Head. You just put parts on him that you like. <laughs> and make up whatever God you want. He's the Lord. He doesn't change. He'll be the same in 10 million years. And the Bible has, uh, has incredible prophecies to, to show itself true. you got a resurrection with over 500 witnesses who uh, upon death said, no, I saw him raised from the dead. You've got um, uh, uh, all the things that God's given us. And he says, this is the truth. But some people can't handle the truth because it offends their lifestyle. <laughs> you know, when I became a Christian, the Bible was against my whole lifestyle. <laughs> Everything I did, the Bible seemed like it was against. I had to decide who was God, me or God, and let the Lord be God, because I already knew I didn't know everything. Fortunately, God brought me to that point where I realized I didn't know everything, and, 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 and don't be, be able to handle the truth. Be able to handle the truth. Look back at chapter 6. Chapter 6. Watch just the conversation <laughs> Same people, different argument with Jesus. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had, been, when they had heard this, uh, said, this isn't a hard saying, who can hear it? So he's with disciples who are listening to him. The Pharisees are listening also. It's going to turn into a big, long argument with the Pharisees. But the some of the disciples are saying, whoa, this guy's saying he's the only way to heaven. Not Moses, not the law. Wow. And they said, this is a hard saying. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? And so they couldn't handle the truth. But there were, verse 64, but there were some of you that believed not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who, the, who it was that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, uh, say I unto you that no man can come to me except were given him of the Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Couldn't handle the truth. Couldn't handle the truth. What a sad thing. Because the truth sets you free. The truth sets you free. I've said it before, but I'd rather a doctor tell me I have cancer than say, you know what, I don't want you to feel bad. You don't have cancer. Oh, truth, truth makes us things are fixing things. Yeah, living in la-la land makes you feel good for a while. But living in la-la land is la-la land. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And, and, and you can tell yourself things, but don't you want to know the truth if you're in trouble? If it, you, know, you, you can go ahead and, and say, you know what? I don't believe that check engine light. I just feel like my car has no problems. The alarm is saying that, I need, that there's no oil in my car, but you know what? I don't want to feel bad. I believe in my heart. That just means I do have oil, that little red light. You know, it'd be much better to just accept, I need to stop and put oil in my car. It helps you. 
But I feel bad. I feel like I failed. I feel like my, I'm not a good car driver. Quit worrying about how you feel. Goodness. People reject truth because they want to feel good about themselves. Stop. Okay, you forgot to put oil in your car. No. You got the truth. Go put oil in your car. Why don't I feel bad about myself? Stop worrying about how you feel. We're so feeling-based. I feel, I want to feel, I want to feel. Stop. Be able to handle the truth. Just sometimes, sometimes people, they're failing in their life. They're failing and they're messing things up. And, and life is screaming at them. You're messing this up. You're messing this up. You're failing. And, 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 and it's amazing. They just won't accept it. You're bad at your money. No, I'm not. I just am unlucky. No, you're bad at your money. You've been unlucky too many times for it to be accident. You always end up in major debt. You always end up with a financial disaster. You're bad at your money. No, I'm not. I'm good at my money. And you're going to be broke the rest of your life because you won't face it. You won't face it. And, and, and everybody's mean to me. Everybody hates me. And then somebody just walks up and says, you know, nobody likes you because of the way you act. It's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault. You know what sets you free if it just said, you know what? I'm kind of a jerk. <laughs> you know what would help you? If you just said, you know, I, I have, most everybody I run across doesn't like me and says I'm nasty. Maybe I really am. <laughs> and, 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 and you might find out you get set free. But people can't handle the truth. And what they do, they demonize the messenger. Therefore, they couldn't handle the truth. Many couldn't handle it. Number three. Um, let's go to John chapter, uh, let's do John chapter 8 again. Really, really important verses. Verse 36, here's a good therefore. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What's a therefore about? If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If Jesus makes you free. Why is that therefore? Therefore? There's several things in this passage we can find. Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay. Amen. That's one of them. Good. You're, you're the servant of sin, and uh, the Son will set you free. Okay. Somebody else? It's all a little bit along that line, but there's some more little details there, here and there. Anybody else? Jeopardy music. Well, verse 32, it says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus is the truth. Yes, one? Yep. That's, I just wrote a few things down. They're all kind of related. The truth sets you free. You're no longer the servant when Jesus sets you free. This is a fascinating concept in verse 33. They answered Sim, said, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? This is one of the craziest things in this whole thing in, in John chapter 8 because the argument is so illogical. These Jews are saying, um, and he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they say, we're Abraham's seed, we're Jewish. We've never been in bondage to anybody. What are you talking about? You are taken captives by the Assyrians, by the Persians, by the Babylonians. You're currently underneath the, the Romans. You ever notice right next to your temple is this massive uh, fortress overlooking your temple, and you get Roman soldiers all over the place? You're underneath the Roman Empire right now. You've never been servants to anyone? What are you talking about? You don't remember Babylon? But you know, a lot of people, it's a lot easier to walk in pride and have selective memory and lie to ourselves. He says, you should know the truth. Truth should make you free. First of all, they're missing his point. He's talking spiritually. They said, we've never been in bondage to anybody. <laughs> well, actually you have. Actually, go tell the Romans you're not underneath them right now and watch them crucify you because you're underneath them right now. But you, you're missing the point. The point is not physical slavery. It's spiritual slavery. Why? What's it? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. The, the, the wages of sin. It says, uh, it, he says there, um, we be Abraham, Abraham, Abraham's seed. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Jesus says, uh, and you say, you shall be made free. Verse 34, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. It says, you commit sin, you're the servant of sin. Romans 6 also says this. And, and then, then verse 35 says, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. And if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. One of the things he says is, you're no longer a servant if I set you free. <coughs> I make you a son. And I say, he says, you know, the servant doesn't stay in the house. The servant comes and serves and leaves. He goes to his own quarters, or he even leaves the property altogether. But when the son sets you free, you're no longer a servant. You understand that? Satan, when you become his servant and you're the servant of sin, you're never free. You're always in bondage of sin, but God sets you free to be a servant. And now he says, you know what? I don't want you to be my servant. I want you to be my friend. And do it at John 15. He sets you free from the, being a servant and a slave, which you are. And he says, I'm going to make you free, and you'll be free indeed. In John chapter 15, in verse 15, he says, Henceforth I call you not servants from hereafter. You're no longer a servant. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father made known unto you. He says, look, I'm not going to keep you as a servant. You're not a slave when you come to me. He says, you were the slave of sin because you couldn't stop. But now I'm setting you free. And now I'm going to make you my friend. Now you can come into my house forever. You know, in the Old Testament, there was uh, a servant, uh, a slave, after they were with you for a while, you could set them free. And if the servant said, you know what, I don't want, I, I don't want to be free. I love this family. They've treated me right. They've done so many good things for me. There was a process you could go through in the Old Testament where someone, whether a servant or a slave, either one, could uh, be set free, but then they say, no, I don't want to. I want to serve you forever. I love you, and I want to stay at your house. And by the way, it's hard to understand that in America because being a servant in America would always be bad, but in other countries, um, a, a lot of people want to be a servant of a good person, and it, it's, it's a very stable, secure place. But, but the, you could go, and you go to that person and say, I don't want to be free. I want to serve you. And they would go through a process, and they would be a free servant. They would choose to continue to serve out of love. And that's what God makes us. We serve him willingly. He sets us free and we say, no, I want to serve you. If you love me, keep my commandments. I want you to be a, a willing servant. And, and, and he says, you're my friend. I'm setting you free. And the truth shall make you free indeed. You're no longer the servant of sin, but you're a willing servant of God. You're in the house of God. You're no longer in bondage to sin. You are now a person who goes into the house of God, and I set you there. It's a wonderful thing. Next, therefore your sin remaineth. This is a kind of a sad one, but go to John chapter uh, uh, 9. John chapter 9, therefore... Therefore, your sin remaineth. This is the one I'll spend the most time on if I was going to title this. I titled it John and Acts, but I could title it, Therefore, your sin remaineth, because we'll spend a little time on this one. John chapter 9, in verse 41, Jesus said unto them, If, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore, your sin remaineth. Therefore, your sin remaineth. Just from that verse, why does your sin remain? Anybody? Raise your hand. Why does your sin remain? Somebody? Anybody? Yes. Still, still blind? Okay. And because, yes. They refused to acknowledge they had sin. Yeah. It's part of it. He says, but now uh, you, but, uh, you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. They were blind and didn't know it. They were blind and didn't know it. You know, the, the whole passage here is fascinating, and, and, and all the things that Jesus is going through. They thought they saw, but uh, they did not believe the truth that was right in front of them. Look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had, uh, uh, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when they had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe in the Son of God? This is the man who was blind and was healed. 
And when they couldn't explain it, they, and, and he said, look, a guy came up and healed me, and, and I, I can see now. And they said, you're lying. Uh, you're a servant of his. You're a follower of his. I don't know who he is. And they finally threw him at the synagogue and said, you're just, you're just wicked and, and all these things. And Jesus found him and says, do you believe in the Son of God? Remember, when Jesus met him, the guy is blind. He didn't know he was talking to the guy who healed him. And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus answered and said to him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he which talketh with thee. So Jesus said, I'm the Son of God. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him, showing, of course, Jesus is God. Jesus accepted the worship. And Jesus said, for judgment am I come into this world, that they which see might see, and they which, uh, they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were, him, with which, which were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And he says, yeah, yeah, you think you see. This man knew he was blind, and, and he was blind spiritually. And you think you see, but you don't see. The Son of God is standing in front of you. The Messiah you're looking for is talking to you, and you've been arguing with me for two chapters. And you deny everything I say. You deny reality. You deny everything, and you're not accepting me as your, as, as your Savior. And uh, you're not believing. They were blind, and the truth is right in front of them. See, pride and excuses, they didn't want to accept the truth. Go back to chapter 2. I want to go back a little bit. But in chapter 2, as you follow this, and here's one thing. I'm going to tell you something about Bible reading that will help you a lot. Is I, We give you a Bible reading chart and hope you're finishing up your Bible this year and you're reading it through. And, and please do that. We want you to finish your Bible through and read it every day. But one of the things you can do, if you ever can listen or read large passages at a time, and I find with me, if I actually listen to audio Bible for a long period of time, you see a flow of things where sometimes reading three or four chapters at a time, you don't see it. But if you see the book of John, you see most of the book of John is just two weeks of Jesus' life, most of the book of John. And you see the Pharisees and the rejection and how, that they, um, how the process goes because they act very spiritual and say, look, we'll believe you if you show us a sign. And that's what they tell him. And, uh, and, 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 and he goes, and, and they go in, in chapter 2 and verse 18. They say this, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said, I, that, that can't happen. He said, I'm going to give you the sign. I'm going to give you a sign of the resurrection. Now, I'm going to give a whole bunch of signs that other people are going to believe. The blind guy... I'll heal him. I'll heal the guy who has a withered hand. I'll heal the guy who has never walked before, is paralyzed. I'll heal another blind, blind man named Bartimaeus. I'll heal the possessed guy. I'll make the lame walk. I'll feed 5,000. I'll do all these miracles and miracles and miracles. But for you, you get one sign. That's the sign of Jonah the prophet. That is three days in the earth, and you get that one. And if that won't convince you, nothing else is going to convince you. But then he continues to live his life. They watch him do miracles. And instead of saying, you just, that guy's never walked. We've seen him for 40 years. And he's never walked. You just healed him. That's incredible. Maybe you are the Messiah. You know what they do? It's the Sabbath day. What are you doing? Not, wow, he might be the Messiah. No, you healed him on the wrong day. Why? They didn't want the truth. They were blind. They missed everything right in front of them. Pride, excuses, show us a sign. And then we continue in this, in, in, to our passage just read, where he says they're blind, and Jesus does miracle after miracle. We see in this very passage, in the very area here, we see in chapter 6 where uh, he's doing miracles. He feeds the 5,000. He walks on water. He goes and, and, and preaches the truth and shows them that he fulfills prophecy. He confounds them with the scripture and shows them the scripture. He goes and heals this blind man and does all these things. And then they come to him again and says, no, if you're the son of God, we'd believe on you. You've not shown us anything yet. We're, not, we're, we're, we're free. You're saying we're servants to sin. We're free. We, we have everything we need. The blind man is healed, and they say, who healed you? 
Jesus. No, they said, hey, they, they, some man healed me. He, 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 you're a follower of Jesus. I don't know who Jesus is. Well, he couldn't have healed you. Um, I can see. They stormed to his parents. Hey, what happened to your son? Ask him. He's an adult. No, you're followers of Jesus too. No, we don't know anything about Jesus. Our son was blind and he can see now. We don't, we're happy. You shouldn't be. It's, a, it's just part of this Jesus thing. And you're following, and they're following him. And they say, you know, and they're afraid of the Pharisees. They say, go ask him again. Because he was there. We weren't there. All we know is our son has been blind his whole life. He's like 40 years old and he can see now. Never do they stop and say, that's awesome. Or, wow, he healed him. No. They go up and put everybody on trial. And they say, you must be a follower of him. Well, he can see. You're following Jesus then. I, he's, the guy tells him, I don't know who Jesus is. I don't know what you're talking about. But a guy walked up and healed me. And they threw him out of the synagogue. So you're not part of the synagogue anymore. You're out of, You're kicked out. Why? It wasn't a matter of a sign. I remember a conversation with someone and, uh, and, 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 and who'd rejected God. And, and, and they had rejected God, and I was talking to them, and, and God had blessed them, and I talked to them, and, and they were very, very blessed, and, and, and I, I talked to them about serving God and, and, and being saved and serving the Lord, and they rejected Christ in sort of a way that was kind of, well, you know, I don't need God. I got everything going, and then, and then the life fell apart. And I went to them, and I said, you know, kind of hit bottom here. The Lord's calling me. He wants to save you. I want you to turn to Jesus. Why would I turn to a God who'd make everything in my life be bad? I said, well, you kind of rejected him when he's very good to you. You rejected him when your life's terrible. What is God supposed to do to make you receive him? Maybe the problem's with you. Maybe you just don't want to receive God. You'll find this. Somebody say, you can prove me there's a God. I'll believe it. Then you start proving it to me. They say, well, you've got to prove it a better way than that. I've got to see him. And they'll keep changing if they don't accept Christ, they will keep changing the borders. They'll keep changing the requirements. The goalposts will be moved again. Because some people just don't want to receive the truth because they're blind. Jesus was standing there doing miracles right in front of them. Give us a sign. We'll believe. Okay, here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 20, 30. Well, show us a real sign. Well, that was on the wrong day of the week. Well, uh, uh, you can't heal that guy. That person's a sinner. That person wasn't even a Jewish person. He was a Samaritan. He was a... <laughs> and they always found an excuse. They always found an excuse. And, and, and you'll always be able to convince yourself. But you know God's revealed himself to you. And he just says, I've given you enough. Take the light I've given and receive it, and I'll give you more. But... <clears throat> when you keep moving the goalposts and, 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 and keep changing it, it's a matter your sin remains because you've chosen to be blind. He fed the 5,000. They saw the miracles. They just got skeptical. But then they just didn't receive it. If you look in, in chapter 6, go back there again. And uh, we see... An, Actually, it's uh, chapter, uh, let me see if it's chapter 9, and uh, yeah, verse 15. It's chapter 9, verse 15, sorry, I, was, I think it was chapter 6, chapter 9, it says, again, Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay in mine eyes, and, and wash, and, and I wash, and do see. Therefore, says him the Pharisees, This man is not of God. Because he keepeth not the Sabbath. The other said, How can this man be a sinner do such a miracle? And there was a division among them. Then said they, the blind man, What sayest thou of him, that he that he did open the eyes? Is he a prophet? But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they had called the parents of him that received his sight. And they said, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How did he now see? And his parents answered and said, We know this is our son, and he was born blind. But what this means, and now he seeth, we don't know that. In verse 22, just watch the response. 
the, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, uh, for the Jews had agreed that anyone who did confess that he was Christ should be put out of the synagogue. It was already decided ahead of time. So just understand, they were blind. They were blind. And they didn't even know it. How many times have, how many of us, how many of you, we didn't know you're blind? How many of you in this room, before you came to Christ, you didn't know you were blind? You didn't know you couldn't see? How many of you are like that? You couldn't, you didn't know it? Okay, there's lots of us. Yeah, most of us. You were smart. Got a whole bunch of degrees in our room with uh, a whole bunch of uh, smart people, successful people, and of all kinds, every background. And you thought, man, I know, I understand God. And all of a sudden, God revealed and said, no, you're lost. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. And then you, you really realize that. And if you, if you think that you know everything about God and you think that you're going to get to God by being a good person and, and all that stuff, you made it up, just understand you don't know it, you might not see it, but you are blind. And only receiving Jesus Christ will save you. And you'll, the scales will fall off your eyes like they did to Saul, who was a very religious man and knew everything about the Bible and, and he was, thought he knew everything and he was very zealous and he knew nothing. He was actually he was actually killing Christians who were going to give him the message and, and that uh, he would become one of them. Understand that we can be blind, and therefore you're blind. Why? Because you don't think you have sin. That's what he said. You're blind because you don't think you have sin. You think you're so good. You think you're cleanse yourself, and that's why you're blind. Next, um, let's go to chapter 10 and verse 17. The good news is, is God is in the business of making the blind see, and uh, he can make all of us see, amen? Next one is chapter 10, verse 17. Some pretty heavy ones there. It says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. Therefore my Father loveth me. That's beautiful. Pretty easy one here. Why does the Father love Jesus? In this passage, anybody? Uh, yeah, did I read the right verse? Chapter uh, 10, verse 17? Yep. Anybody? Besides one? Hey, Mark? Lay down his life. Remember that the, the one important thing to understand the love of God is Jesus was not killed. He sacrificed himself. He laid down his life. It's, he says that in verse 18, he said, uh, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Remember, he could have called the angels. He could have never come uh, to earth. He could have done anything. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He laid down his life. Of course, we know John 15 and verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That is the love of God, that he laid down his life willingly. And the Father says, that kind of love and sacrifice, I love it. And it makes me love you even more. And, uh, and that's, that, that's what he has there. And it's wonderful. Let me finish just a couple real quick. We've got to, go, to finish up. Um, uh, let's see. Let's go to John 11. John 11. Therefore Jesus groaned in the spirit, and therefore Jesus wept. In verse 33, it says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Therefore when he saw them weeping. And, uh, and then it says down in verse 36, it, it says, uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, <clears throat> um, verse 37, it says, Then said some, of this, uh, said some of them, said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused even that this man should not have died? Jesus therefore groan, uh, again groaning in, his, in himself cometh to the grave, uh, it was a cave, and, it, and, it, and a stone lay by it. Jesus groaned in his spirit inside. He said, oh, twice. Why did Jesus groan in his spirit? I got a whole sermon on this, and I can't, I can't tell you all of it in one thing. But a couple of reasons, of course, everybody was hurting. Jesus 
Yeah. That's the, actually the biggest reason is they came to him saying, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus, why'd you allow this? And, and the ultimate reason is they didn't trust him. He was also groaning because they were brokenhearted, because they couldn't wait to see what he was going to do. He was going to raise him from the dead. There's a lot of reasons here. It's all, it all comes, you know, Jesus hurt when they, have to, when they hurt. It said Jesus wept. Why? Because they were, they were brokenhearted. They were sorrowful. But Jesus groaned when they kept on saying, why? Why weren't you here? Why didn't you save him? Why did, he was going to do it all. But they weren't patient. They didn't trust him. He didn't come right away on their timing. And, and, and he groaned in his spirit because they didn't just say, okay, Jesus, I don't know why I didn't come, but I trust you. Whatever you think's best. And, they, and he groaned in his spirit. And the last one we'll finish up is, is, is Acts 3.19. God loves us. We don't want to be blind. We want to be set free. The Son will make you free if you'll believe on Him. And He loves you. And He wants to set you free. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Beautiful. It says this, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent ye therefore. Repent is a word people don't like very much, but the word means to change your mind. Two, two words, meta, uh, it means uh, two different parts. One is uh, to go a different direction, and one is your mind, and it's just to change the way you think. Repent and say, you know what, I was wrong. Why? Because when you do that, you'll be converted and saved. And the Bible says, times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. I want to say religion can't refresh your soul. Uh, it's the Lord. The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And when you go ahead and repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I do have sin, and Jesus is my Savior, and I receive him. You do that, and you are converted. And times of refreshing come in the presence of the Lord. No more dry soul, no more emptiness. You know the love of God. You know his presence in your life. You know what it's like to go into his house. You know what it's like to have him as your father. And the times of refreshing come from God's presence. So please repent, it says. Repent you, therefore, and be converted. They're telling these people who are listening. Why? Because God will refresh your soul. His presence will do that. And he wants to save you, and he loves you. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for the chance to teach your word. I pray today that all of us would be willing to receive the truth. I pray we wouldn't just make up things in our mind. Thank you for the word of God that's a light uh, unto our feet, a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. Thank you for guiding us. And I pray today that if anybody has never just that the scales fall off their eyes, they receive Jesus into their life, and they would trust him as Savior and know your love. They just turn to you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us truth. Thank you for Jesus being raised from the dead and dying for our sins. Thank you for laying down your life. The whole gospel is in these therefores, and thank you for that. Help us to be strong enough to receive the truth and not just do what we want to do, but do what you command and, and, and turn to you in our need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.